Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you all here today for this webinar on a novel view on skin inflammation by means of raster scanning optoacoustic mesoscopy. I'm Dr. Tim Devling, Director of Sales and Applications at Ithera Medical, and I'll be moderating this session. The webinar itself will last for about 40 minutes, and we really do encourage questions. If you maximize the GoTo tool, you can see a question box where you can type them in and we'll answer them all at the end. The webinar is also going to be recorded and we will send you a link to the recording over the next few days. So our speaker today is Dr. Juan Aguirre, Group Leader for Optoacoustic Mesoscopy at the Institute for Biological and Medical Imaging at the Helm Helmholtz Centrum Munich and at the Chair of Biological Imaging of the Technical University of Munich. Juan has been a pioneer in the development and application of RSOM in skin research, and I really look forward to seeing his work. So over to you, Juan, I'll just transfer the screen. Okay. You are now the presenter. All right. Uh, if you just switch your screens again. Perfect. All right. So, hello to everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, for the introduction. So, yeah, I'm Juan Aguirre. I am group leader of the Acoustic Mesoscopy Group at the Institute of Biological and Medical Imaging in the Hanford Centrum. And also have a second affiliation and the Chair of Biological Imaging at the Technical University of Munich. And yes, I'm going to talk about raster scanning of the acoustic mesoscopy and uh, the novel uh, view it gives on skin inflammation. Uh, so this is when, what I'm going to talk about. In, this is the index of, of, of the talk. Uh, I will first uh, explain a little bit the motivation for developing ARSOM, and I will explain also briefly some of the basic concepts of the technique. I will explain also what things, what is that you can image with, with ARSOM. And then I will talk about the clinical prospects in inflammation and yeah, and so on. So uh, introduction to ARSOM, uh, motivation and basic concepts. Um, uh, motivation is the motivation is basically optical imaging. So optical imaging technologies are those imaging technologies that make use of light to generate contrast. And what happens is that optical imaging basically drive large areas of clinical routine. Uh, so for example, in picture A, we can observe an histological slice of a skin biopsy corresponding to melanoma. Uh, and, and, the, and this histological slice is observed with an optical microscopy. This is done routinarily for, st for staging and diagnosis in many diseases in hospitals all over the world. And in picture B, we can observe a medical doctor doing diagnosis or maybe severity assessment using his eyes. And basically the eyes are natural optical imaging cameras. Um, so as I said, uh, optical imaging drives large areas of the clinical routine. Uh, however, uh, optical imaging technology has severe fundamental limitations, basically due to light scattering. Uh, the problem is that uh, high resolution is only achieved at very shallow depths due to the so-called uh, light diffusion limit. So if we illuminate tissue, biological tissue, for example, a hand with a torch, as it is shown in figure A, uh, we can see that light goes to the tissue. Uh, however, we cannot distinguish any structure inside the hand. This is because light travels following a diffusion process due to scattering. So if we want to observe the inside of the tissue, if we want to observe inside the tissue uh, with optical imaging, we need to cut the tissue and slide slice it very thin and then we can observe it using a microscope or a regular camera or, or whatever and the high resolution limit with depth is between 200 micrometers and one millimeter uh, at those depths uh, photons still don't do not have time to scatter enough so for example in the human skin uh, you can see a, a shim in, in panel C, C a standard confocal microscope cannot penetrate more than 200 micrometers keeping high resolution this means that only the epidermis and the most upper dermis of, of, of uh, the most upper part of the dermis can be observed. So in this context appears optoacoustic imaging. Uh, the aim of optoacoustic imaging is to do optical imaging with high resolution in deep tissue, non-invasively, obviously. So what we want to do is beat the, the diffusion limit. 
and how we do this. So what we need is an is uh, an, an array of ultrasound transducers, and we place the array of the or, or just one single ultrasound transducer. We place it on top of the tissue we want to image, and then what we need is a pulse light emitter. Uh, and, and then with the pulse light emitter, we illuminate uh, the tissue, and then the light travels uh, through the tissue, and eventually it is absorbed by the most uh, efficient light absorbing chromophores, by the darkest chromophores. So, for example, hemoglobin uh, in blood. And upon light absorption, this undergo a thermoelastic expansion, and then an ultrasound uh, wave is, is emitted. And then the ultrasound wave is detected, and the signal is processed. And what we do is we generate a reconstruction, a three-dimensional reconstruction of the light absorption. So like this, uh, contrast is based on light absorption. So contrast is optical, we are doing optical imaging, but the resolution to depth ratio is that of ultrasound imaging. And this means that we can keep high resolution going uh, while going deep in tissue. So um, with these images, uh, probably the concept is enlightened in a better way. In the panel A, uh, we see again the hand and uh, illuminated by a torch and we cannot see anything. And then in, in picture B, we see an optoacoustic image of a, of a hand as well, uh, taken by an optoacoustic system developed by the group of Matsumoto et al. And, and what we see is uh, the darkest chromophores, the dark, the dark areas of tissue, mainly uh, the hemoglobin, and uh, we, that's why we can see uh, mostly the the vascular structure. So the values of the pixels, the values of the boxes, correspond to absorbed light energy, absorbed light energy per volume, so the units are joules per cubic centimeter. And again, uh, we have optical contrast, we're doing optical imaging, but we preserve high resolution in deep tissue. Um, we can classify optoacoustic imaging depending on the resolution to depth relation given by the acoustic absorption properties of tissue. Uh, we can find the microscopy regime and in the microscopy regime, we image at the organ level at a depth of a few centimeters, and then we get a resolution around 200 microns. We can also image in the mesoscopic regime. Then we are imaging at the tissue level. Penetration depth now is a few millimeters, and resolution is of the order of tens of micrometers. Uh, this regime is ideal for skin imaging since it's, it covers the whole skin depth. And uh, also we can do microscopy and usually, when doing optoacoustic microscopy, uh, most of the implementations use focused light sources, and therefore the resolution now is given by is governed by light diffraction, and there is no there are no substantial differences in terms of resolution and penetration with the standard optical imaging. Um, so other authors use a different classification criteria, uh, depending whether the resolution is optical or acoustical. But me personally, I find this classification better because it's more operative. So in this talk, we are talking about arson. Therefore, uh, we are focusing on the optoacoustic mesoscopy regime. Um, so in my group, we have been developing clinical raster scan optoacoustic mesoscopy already for a few years. Uh, to do arson, uh, what we need is a transducer, and then the transducer is raster scan on top of the skin, and we, while we illuminate using a pulsed laser. And then at each point of the raster scan, as, as shown in figure A, uh, we acquire A lines and then we can combine the, in, the A lines to, to form the 3D image. So you can see a picture of the real system in panel B. This was originally published in Nature by America Engineering. And yeah, the system uh, can obtain images with a lateral resolution of 30 micrometers and an actual resolution of 7 micrometers. And acquisition time is around one minute for a field of view of four millimeters by two millimeters. And th this system some time ago was, already, was taken by Ithera and it's, and it's been further developed. And in panel, in, pa in panel C, we can see Ithera's system. So now, what can we image with Arson? Um, so in this slide, I show the kind of images that the system can achieve. This is a cross-sectional image of, of healthy skin. And um, the whole microvascular structure can be observed due to hemoglobin because hemoglobin is, is dark, absorbs light nicely. Uh, we can observe the tip of the, small, of the smallest capillary uh, in green together with the upper plexus and the connecting vessels. And also we can observe structures in the epidermis uh, due to melanin. Uh, here the color, the color code is very important. So 
um, it depends on the frequency content of the, of the optoacoustic signals. And in red, we have low frequencies, and in green, we have high frequencies. Uh, low frequencies means uh, large vessels. So in red, we see the larger, the larger vessels. And uh, high frequency means a small vessel. So in green, we can observe the tip of the capillary loops and the smallest uh, vessels. Uh, so uh, with Arson, we can observe the whole microvascular structure. And in my opinion, it's, it's very difficult for other technologies uh, to observe the microvascular structure in such a comprehensive way. And the ability to observe the skin in such a way has deep implications for the clinic not only in dermatology, but also in several uh, major systemic diseases. It is important to understand that this is a 3D image, image what's, what I'm showing here. It is a cross-sectional view, as shown in the view seen representation, uh, in top right of, 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 the slides, of the slide. And the arrow represents the point of view of the viewer of, of the image, which is a maximum intensity projection. Um, one of the most beautiful aspects, or one of the things that I like most of, of the acoustic imaging is that by changing the excitation wavelength of the laser, one can obtain information of different biomolecules, since each of them has a specific uh, light absorption spectrum. So now the color code is completely different, and each color represents simply a different wavelength. I don't make any distinction between high and low frequencies, okay? Uh, so the wavelength goes from the visible to the short wave infrared, in the visible, uh, we can see hemoglobin and melanin, so we can observe the vascular network, uh, the epidermis and hair. In the near infrared, that's at 730 nanometers, uh, blood doesn't absorb light so strongly anymore. And what we can see is only the melanin, so we can see the epidermis and we can see a hair shaft going inside the, the dermis. And then we're moving uh, to the short wave infrared. There is a fat peak at, two, at uh, 1,210 nanometers. And there we can observe uh, the sebaceous glands, we can observe the lipid layer, and also we can observe uh, the fat climbing through the hair shaft and so on. Uh, in 1210, we can observe also water. So this image uh, is a mixture of fat and water. And then in, at 1450 nanometers, uh, basically we can also, there is a water peak and we can observe water and we can see the water content of, of the epidermis. Um, in this slide, I show another example which illustrates the imaging abilities of arson regarding the microvascular structure. Uh, again, the color code uh, has changed, and now in green we observe the melanin, and in yellow we observe the hemoglobin. So in panel A, uh, we observe the microvascular structure of, of, of the nail fold. Um, in the nail fold, the microvascular structure follows a quite unique pattern. Um, basically, the capillary loops get parallel to the skin, very close to the nail. Uh, and this can be nicely observed by, by arson. So the structures, the parallel structures near the nail of corresponding to capillary loops can, can be observed very nicely. And then as we, as we move away from, from the nail, going, let's say, going towards the arm, uh, the capillary loops um, start to get perpendicular to the skin, to the skin surface. And then due to some physics, basically due to, the, due to the numerical aperture of the detector, what we see is the tip of the capillary loops. And then we can see the rest of the, um, we can see the rest of the microvascular structure, the, largest, the larger arterioles and venules and so on. Um, also what we can do is uh, the so-called mixing. Uh, so by taking the spectrum, we can do, uh, we can apply by taking spectral images, uh, by doing spectral imaging, we can apply a mix of algorithms. And then we can get uh, the concentration of, of different biomolecules. We can get, for example, the concentration of uh, oxyhemoglobin. We can get the concentration of this, of this oxyhemoglobin. And we can get the concentration of melanin. And this means that uh, we can also calculate, for example, the, the oxygenation. We can calculate the oxygenation level at the micro, at the capillary level, at the microvascular level. So at each microvascular or at each microvessel, for each microvessel, we can calculate uh, oxygenation values. And then last uh, but not least, um, we can uh, arson can be used as well to assess the microvascular function. And here, when I say uh, assess the microvascular function, I mean uh, a study or assess the physiology and the line. Uh, the mechanisms that the microvascular network used to react to stimulus like heat, chemicals, and so on. 
Uh, a very common example of this is the release of nit nitrum oxide by the endothelium. Um, and to characterize such function, what we do is stimulate the skin and then use arson to characterize the microvascular, to, the microvascular response. Uh, so, for example, we can heat the skin uh, to 42 and 43 degrees to obtain the so-called heat-induced hyperemia, which is largely mediated by endothelium-dependent NO release. So, in the panel F, we can see the skin before heating, and in, uh, according to Arson, and then in panel uh, G, uh, we can see the skin after heating, again, a cross-sectional function, and then we can see how uh, there is a lot of... Um, microvascular dilation and a lot of vasodilation and also new vessels that were not perfused uh, get perfused so there is an increment in, in perfusion and we can nicely observe this phenomena and therefore we can quantify uh, other techniques like laser doppler imaging for example pure optical imaging techniques can only observe uh, small blobs and, and then try to do quantification with that as, as it's shown in panel A and B. Um, yeah, so from, from the ARSOM images, we can do quantification and then, for example, quantify the partial volume increment and then uh, do quantitative, uh, a quantitative study of, of, of the microvascular function. So, uh, as a small summary of imaging abilities, we can do morphological imaging of the microvascular structure. Um, so, we can do, this is very useful for dermatology, we believe. We can do a functional imaging of the microvascular of the microvasculature, uh, and this should be useful for systemic disease diseases. And then also we can do molecular imaging, and so image fat, image water, and so on. And probably this may have applications in cosmetics and probably other fields. So now uh, I come back to the first image I showed uh, uh, because. Um, from, from now to the end of the talk, uh, this is the color code that I'm going to use. Um, so now again, in red, we see low frequencies, big vessels, and in green, we see uh, small vessels, okay? high frequencies. So red, low frequencies, green, high frequencies, and small vessels green, large vessels red. Um, so now uh, let's change and let's go to the clinical prospects in inflammation. So we'll talk about psoriasis, minimum erythematous calculation, and allergy testing. These are the things that we've been studying lately here in my group. Um, so let's start with psoriasis. What I'm going to talk about is, is a summary of, of the paper, uh, Precision Assessment of Level 3 Psoriasis Biomarkers with Ultrasound Broadband of the Acoustic Mesoscopy, which was published in Nature Biomedical Engineering. So if anybody uh, wants more details on the study, they can go to the paper or they can shoot me a message, an email, and I can send them the paper. Um, so, uh, the thing is, or, 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 so psoriasis is probably a, an example of a possible ro robust application, a possible robust application in which uh, arson may play a role. Uh, so, the thing is that uh, psoriasis is a chronic disease, there is no cure for it, and it's in acute phase, it can be severely disabling and it's highly prevalent. But the problem of psoriasis is that its severity is currently assessed using the so-called PASI index, which is an index that is derived by visual inspection. Therefore, it is a subjective index and it's not precise. And this has uh, negative consequences for therapy monitoring and probably also for, for drug discovery. So then what we did is try to image uh, psoriatic plaques, psoriatic skin with, with arson. And when we image a psoriatic plaque uh, and compare it with healthy skin, we immediately realized that we, that arson can observe many of the most uh, relevant hallmarks of the disease. Uh, we can nicely observe many of its path pathological features. For example, we can see how the capillary loops get larger and, and thicker. Uh, we can observe a great deal of vasodilation. Uh, the blood vessels in the upper plexus uh, get thicker and the, up the upper plexus itself also get thicker. Uh, and there is a very important increment uh, of vascularization. So in, in the slides, in the slide, we can see a comparison between healthy skin A and psoriatic skin in B, and we can see all these um, all these changes. I mean, the difference is is super clear. Um, so Arsom can can nicely capture the pathological features of psoriatic skin. Uh, this is another example in which more more details are explained. Um, 
So in panel A, we show uh, the image of the skin of a healthy volunteer, and then the white points, uh, the white arrows point to the capillary loops in the epidermis, and we can observe the upper plexus and the connecting vessels and so on. And then in panel B, we observe how the epidermis, which, which corresponds to psoriatic skin, we can observe how the epidermis got much thicker. This is called acanthosis. And we can see also how the capillary loops grew and enlarge. Um, the white arrow point to one of the tip of the capillary loops. And also we can observe how the upper plexus uh, got thicker uh, due to a marked increase on vascularization. If we go to panel C and D, uh, we can see the top view, uh, top view of the epidermis. And then we can observe in green the tip of the capillary loops. And in the healthy, in healthy skin, the capillary loops are distributed more or less randomly. And in panel D, which corresponds to the capillary loops of the psoriatic skin, top view, uh, we can see that the capillary loops are thicker. And also we can see that there are many more and they are distributed uh, more or less evenly, which is also one of the characteristics of, of psoriasis. Uh, and then also we made the comparison. Of course, we had to make a comparison with, with histology. And uh, yeah, uh, so we imaged some volunteers and then we, we, took, uh, we took biopsies and we did histology and we could, we could uh, quantify and we could uh, verify uh, all the features that we were seeing with, with Arsom and yeah, they have a nice correspondence with, with reality. Um, so yeah, then uh, the nice thing then is that we can do uh, quantification of biomarkers and these biomarkers can, can, are measured from the ARSOM images. Therefore, they are objective, they are accurate and they are precise. For example, we can calculate the blood volume and there is a marked difference between the blood volume of psoriatic plaques and corresponding healthy skin. We can calculate also the fractal number, for example, which is related to the complexity of the microvascular network. Although the fractal number did not show such a striking difference. And also we can calculate, for example, the epidermis thickness with, a, with an accuracy of microns and a precision of, also of microns. And then we can see that there is a huge difference between the, the thickness of the epidermis between psoriatic skin and, and healthy skin. So all these biomarkers can be used uh, to do severity assessment. And there is a big difference with the passive components, with the endurance and so on, and with the redness, because those are... Uh, those are derived by, derived by visual inspection and the biomarkers that are uh, measured by ARSOM are quantitative uh, and are objective and, and are precise. So the next step uh, we wanted to do is check if we can do ARSOM therapy, I mean therapy monitoring with ARSOM of uh, therapy of psoriasis. Um, uh, so in the top row of this slice, this slide, um, we can observe the clinical images of a psoriatic plaque undergoing a standard topical therapy. And below we can see the corresponding ARSOM images. And um, so what we see is uh, how ARSOM can capture nicely the therapeutic effects. So basically uh, the mean length of the capillary loop in, in panel I MLL gradually decreases with therapy and also the thickness of the upper plexus with time decreases and this is uh, panel Y again MPW. So it is very interesting because ARSOM can, can capture therapeutic effects even when the visual observation cannot. Uh, so for example if we look at the top row uh, from day 8 to day 10 the PASI index do not show any change. PASI is 2. Also we can see this on the on the graphs in, in panel M. Uh, however, uh, we see in the ARSOM images that there is a clear decrease of the thickness of the capillary loops uh, and also there is a clear decrease on the, on, so on, on the thickness of the upper plexus. So uh, ARSOM tells us that the, th the therapy is still working while the PASI index tells us that the therapy is not working anymore. Uh, so yeah, our results strongly suggest that ARSOM can perform precision therapy monitoring of psoriasis and this has, in our opinion, this has a strong possible impact for drug testing for the pharma industry uh, and also uh, in the context of precision medicine. So now let's change to minimum erythema dose. Um, again, uh, I will explain just some of the, I, I will show some of the, of, of the data of, 
the main results of, of a paper which was published in British Journal of Dermatology this year. So if anybody is interested in the details, I invite them to shoot me an email or they can just go to Google Scholar and get the, and get the paper. So the thing now is that uh, uh, the, the motivation is objective minimum erythema dose calculation. And yeah, uh, so phototesting is, is, is used generally to assess uh, individual sensitivity to ultraviolet radiation in order to determine adequate UV dosage for phototherapy. So the objective here is to understand what dosage of UV light induces a reaction on the skin. Uh, in the standard procedures, uh, small skin areas are exposed to increases doses of UV radiation. And then the, the aim here is to understand which is the lowest UV dose that induces a delineated erythema. Um, so this UV dose defines the minimal erythema dose. So in this slide, we can observe a picture of the skin of a patient. Uh, 24 hours uh, after receiving UV light doses of, of UV light at increasing, increasing doses, and the minimum erythema dose can be determined at 50 milliliters per square centimeter. Uh, so the problem now again is that visual assessment is the gold standard for minimal, minimum erythema dose determination. However, this is this is prone to observable variability, and therefore we hypothesize that ARSOM might be used for objective assessment of minimum erythema dose. Um, so, yeah, first question is, can we actually observe erythema with arson? So, uh, what we did is perform some uh, minimum erythema dose procedures and then uh, see if arson can capture the erythema effect. So, in the slide, we can observe an arson image of skin before UV exposure in the left. And we can observe also the arson image of exactly the same area after UV exposure. After UV exposure, exactly at the minimum erythema dose, and uh, there are some images. There are some images uh, reveal a lot of the of, of the microscopic uh, changes that uh, define the erythema or that lead to the erythema. So there is a lot of vasodilation and some vessels that um, were not perfused before UV light exposure are now perfused, and we can nicely observe uh, the same structures before and after UV exposure, and nicely observe. Uh, at the at the micro vessel level, all the effects of the erythema, so the vasodilation, uh, more perfusion and perfusion, and so on. So again, uh, if we do the same, but this time at two times the minimum erythema dose, uh, we can observe the vasodilation and we can observe the incrementing perfusion in a much in a much more stronger way. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's we can definitely hypothesize that arson could be used. To do to to perform objective minimum erythema dose determination. Uh, so to further test our hypothesis, that we, what we did is image with arson seven volunteers before and after doing the MED test, the minimum erythema dose test. So in the slide uh, we can see the experimental timeline before, and there we can see the details of the study. So at day zero, we image with arson six regions of the skin in seven patients uh, and then right after we we irradiated them uh, with with uv light following the standard procedure and one day after a clinical expert made the minimum erythema dose evaluation and then right after we perform arson images arson imaging and our results indicate that uh, the change of blood fraction uh, according to arson as measured by arson increases together uh, with the applied UV dose uh, and this clearly suggests that arson could be used eventually uh, for objective assessment of the minimum erythema dose. Uh, so this is seven volunteers we expect to increase uh, to make a larger study uh, soon. And then last but not least I'm going to talk about allergy testing. So again um, uh, the details of the study can be uh, can be seen in in the article quantification of skin sensitivity to ultraviolet. Oh, sorry. So there's some there is some mistake here. Um, this paper was published in Contact Dermatitis, and the title of the paper is uh, "Optoacoustic Mesoscopy Shows Potential to Increase Accuracy of Allergy Past Patch Testing," and it was published in Contact Dermatitis in 2020. So this year, um, yeah. 
So now uh, we change uh, a little bit and we are going to talk about patch testing, uh, clinical assessment. And yeah, so what happens here, so the motivation is that a large percentage of the general population suffer from allergic contact dermatitis and epicutaneous patch testing constitutes uh, the gold standard uh, as a, is the gold standard diagnostic technique. So to perform the test, what we do is uh, we, we take or the MDs do is take the test substances and apply them in the patient's skin, and then one and then a clinician performs visual and palpatory assessment to grade the skin response at two or three days, uh, two or three days later, two or three days after applying the substances, and then the severity of the response the response is graded from zero either zero, which means no response, plus, which means a, a small response, a slight uh, response, plus plus, which means uh, a more severe response, and tri triple plus, which means a very severe uh, response. Uh, so in, in the image A from of the slide, we can see a, a standard patch test, basically. And then, yeah, the main problem here, again, is that clinical assessment is subjective and therefore subject to the physician variation. And another very important problem is that um, uh, is that it's very difficult for the physician many times to distinguish between allergic reaction and irritant contact reactions that arise uh, when the test substance triggers cytotoxic effects on the skin. And so, uh, so irritant reactions uh, are not indicating, uh, do not indicate any underlying allergy, any underlying disorder. So the misinterpretation of allergic reaction as irritant reaction can bring a lot of misdiagnosis of, of um, uh, regarding uh, allergic contact dermatitis. And this may have long-term consequences for the patient. So in figure B, uh, we can observe several clinical and arson images of irritant reactions and allergic reactions uh, corresponding to patch te tests of different grades. And again, as expected, uh, uh, there are some images can observe the effect of allergy and irritation in the microvascular structure. So again, we see a lot of vasodilation, we see a lot of increment uh, in perfusion and so on. So uh, again, what we hypothesized very similarly to our previous studies is that arson could be employed for routine examination of the microvascular structure and contribute to a less subjective and more robust uh, basis for differentiating between allergic and irritant patch test reactions. So to test our hypothesis, what we did is image 60 patients with arson undergoing routine patch testing. So what we did is that for every patient, we applied a patch with a known allergic substances, with known allergic substances for the patient and also a patch uh, with sodium lauryl sulfate as an irritant control. And uh, we made readings of, of, of the effect two, in day two and in day three by an experienced dermatologist. And then also we made uh, arson images. And then from the arson images, we measured several parameters, including blood volume, uh, per skin surface, high frequency to low frequency ratio, and vessel fragmentation. And then after a statistical analysis, we obtained that by using the, the vessel fragmentation and the low high frequency ratio, one can obtain a linear discriminant that can classify whether the reaction was allergic or irritant. So in panel A, B, C, and D, we can, we can see the different, uh, the different uh, parameters that we measured for each of the, for each of, of the reaction, whether it's uh, triple plus allergic, uh, plus plus allergic, plus allergic, and so on. And yeah, in in panel E, we can see uh, we can visualize the linear discriminant analysis result, and then the corresponding uh, rock curve with a sensitivity of 81% and a specificity of 63%. So our results indicate that arson may have may have the potential to be employed for routine examination of the microvascular structure in a percutaneous patch text reaction. And also then it may contribute to a less subjective and more robust basis for differentiating between allergic and irritant patch test reactions. All right, so I think uh, with this, basically that's all. So I would like to acknowledge uh, first, of course, Professor Tejistos. I'm, I'm sure that you've seen his name 
around in many of the papers, a lot of contributions here. And also I would like to acknowledge the acoustic mesoscopy group, uh, Andre Bresnoy, Jai Longhe, and so on, Teresa Nau, Ludwig Engler, uh, etc. Of course, many of my other colleagues from IBMI that have helped me in many ways, and our clinical collaboration collaborators, Clinical Eirich, Tilo Wiedelman, and so on. Uh, this project was funded by, by Inodern, which is a, a European Union project from the 2020, from the 2020 uh, funding scheme. And yeah, if anybody is interested in more of the details, in more details, they can see, uh, they can go to Google Scholar and if they type my name there, they will find all the, all the papers we've written on this. Some of them are technical, some of them are more clinical. And then finally, um, yeah, we are looking, we need uh, collaborators, we need people, we are hiring people. And uh, yeah, if you are interested in this project, uh, please send your CV or also you can write me an email if you have uh, any question. So now here comes the questions. Uh, and for the question session, I will have the help of my colleague, Christine Schaumann, uh, which is a medical doctor from the Technical University of Munich. She's a dermatologist and she has been working in Arsom already for, for more than a year. So my background is uh, more technical, is physics and mathematics, and then Christine's background is uh, clinical. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for, the, for being there. And if you have any question, please shoot them. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Juan. That was um, a great talk. I'm just going to grab back um, control. So one second. And while the questions come in, and I'll just note one, I'll, I will give you a heads up. There are quite a few questions. Uh, I just like everybody to see the actual clinical research system that we have developed based upon Juan's technology. And uh, what we would like to offer is if you would like to see a system in action, either on uh, for clinical research, on healthy volunteers or on small animals, for example, mouse skin imaging, we'd be more than happy to arrange that. So either message me directly on GoTo or you can email uh, info at ithera-medical.com. So yeah, we've got questions, Juan. So all right, I'll begin here. Um, can I look at skin inflammation in mice, especially chemically induced skin inflammation? Uh, yes, definitely. Of course. Yeah, the, the system we have for imaging mice is obviously designed for small animals, so it has a little box that can uh, that can hold the animal and keep it under the anesthesia and so on. So it looks a little bit differently, but uh, yes, it can be done. Uh, a more clinical question is: the blood seems to give the main signal uh, contrast. I would guess that nevi show up very well. But what about the skin contrast itself? What is contributing to that contrast that you see within the skin? Is it blood within the microcapillaries or is it something else like collagen or lipid? So if, if, if you are using visible light, which is generally the case, what gives the contrast is hemoglobin and melanin. So since you are, since, since you are seeing hemoglobin, basically you're seeing the microvascular structure and then if you see the melanin, basically you see the epidermis and you see the melanin in the stratum germinativ, germinativ, oof, I cannot pronounce it correctly. Anyway, of course, if you have a uh, nevi and the nevi is made out of melanocytes, you can nicely see the nevi and then you can see how it penetrates in, in, in the skin and so on. But for this, it's, uh, it's better to use uh, some wavelengths in the near infrared so you only see the nevi and not the, so you only see the melanin and you only see the melanocytes and then you don't see the, the hemoglobin and you don't see the microvascular structure. So then a follow-up question for that is, would you see value in imaging of non-melanoma skin cancers? So for this question, maybe uh, Christine can, can answer. Um, yeah. You can observe the uh, microvessels quite nicely, which can be altered in non-melanoma skin um, cancer. So there is some value to it. Um, there's also um, other groups using OCT who have shown quite nicely the mi microvessels in non-melanoma skin cancer. So yeah, you can do that. Um, yeah. Cool. 
Uh, keeping with the kind of the melanin or, or non-melanin theme, I have an interesting question here, which is, uh, can you measure skin bleaching or skin blanching, I should say? Skin bleaching? Or skin ah, blanching? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, definitely you can. Actually, we have uh, we have a paper on that. So so you can see the skin. So if you mean, so, so if you get a suntan, Definitely, you can see the effect on, on the melanin. There is there is an optic letter on, on that, uh, so you can see how the melanin layer gets thicker and gets and, and the and the total amount of melanin increases. And also, you see the the the, the opposite effect. So if, if if the melanin content for whatever reason goes down, then you nicely see it with with the arson. Uh, there is an optic letter from a paper from 2018, and there. You can nicely see also with correlation with histology and, and so on. Uh, I, sh I should just clarify. There's a second follow-up question here: Is um, skin blanching or skin bleaching caused by the effects of corticosteroids? So perhaps that is a, a question for Christine. Is that a side effect of um, corticosteroids? So after you have an inflammation, you can have a darker or a lighter spot um, that can, can be due to the post-inflammatory hyper or Hypopigmentation um, can on sometimes also be due to corticosteroids, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, something that should be tested, I guess. Yeah. Uh, do, is scabbing an issue? Sorry. Is scabbing or, or formation of scabs a potential issue for our some imaging? Scars. Uh, scars. Uh, scab scabbing. Uh, okay. On Maybe wounds, I, like on wounds. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you mean this? Um, so when the skin heals, basically this uh, uh, the black thing and so on. Uh, yeah, it could be an issue definitely because it will absorb the light. So if you have a goon and it's healing, uh, you can observe the goon healing and all the things that go on there with absorb light and and yeah. You you will see them as as as, as uh, you they will generate contrast in the arson image images. Let's put it like this. Yeah, so I think you answered one of the the, the next question during the talk, but um, it's what uh, parameters can you take from the blood vessels that you observe? Can you see, yeah. for example, uh, 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 tortuosity and so on? Yeah. Uh, so since you get a three D map of the microvascular structure. You can get as many parameters as you can, as your imagination can reach, right? So you can measure tortuosity, you can measure diameter, you can measure length, you can measure volume, you can measure density, uh, you can measure also uh, structure, structural complexity, and yeah, and so on. Here's a, an, an interesting one: is have you noticed a difference between uh, hemoglobin levels in the skin of young versus old? Uh, people ah, so this is a That's nice question this is a very interesting question and we have not done those experiments so far but i would like we would like to do them yeah, and and uh, kind of in that vein is rather than imaging disease or excessive response in the skin could you measure the response of normal skin for example to rejuvenation or regeneration and would uh, the oxygen parameters perhaps be a good indicator of this so, uh, so it was very long. Sorry, Tim. Could could you repeat the question? Uh, so, rather than looking at the the kind of severe disease or yeah. severe disease severity, uh, could you look could you look at rejuvenation or, or skin yeah. regeneration? And yeah. does oxygen make sense to look at? Yeah, yeah. So, so we've run some experiments of, of, on that with quite promising results, and yeah, of course we can we can see a lot of markers uh, related to rejuvenation or. or or, re or related to aging, right? So, for example, it's it's known that uh, with aging, the the microvascular density changes, and there is some certain rarefaction, right? And of course, it could this could be imaged nicely with with arson. Um, yeah. Also, we can measure water content and, and and lipid content, which may be, I guess, as well related to aging, right? And, and general uh, skin health. But in principle, I would say that that the that the vessel density and the vessel microvessel structure 
would be one of the most powerful um, biomarkers uh, related to aging. Cool. So that would be an area to look at, definitely. I mean, if, particularly if you consider there may be a change in hemoglobin levels between young and old as well. Well, yeah. Yeah, this is an interesting question. I mean, I, I, as far as I know, I mean, I, I cannot remember any paper or literature related to this, but I guess there are some studies or some preliminary studies out there. Okay, and now a good technical question for you is, um, what's the center frequency of the transducer in the r -SOM array? And is there an optimum sound emission frequency for tissues like the epidermis or capillary loops? Yeah, so... In general, uh, the acoustic signals are broadband, are very broadband, and the smaller the the smaller the the smaller the structure that emits the acoustic signal, the broader the bandwidth. Uh, so the optimum the optimum frequency of the transducer is uh, infinite bandwidth. This would be the optimum uh, frequency content, of course. Uh, Higher frequencies get absorbed uh, by tissue, um, so obviously it will reach a point that it, it, it wouldn't make sense to, to, to go for higher frequencies. But in principle, the broader the, the broader the, the bandwidth, uh, the better. Uh, in this case, most of the images I've shown in the paper are with a transducer with a central frequency of 50 megahertz. But this transducer have a very nice uh, and a very unique bandwidth. And it, range, it ranges from from 10 megahertz to more than 100 megahertz. So let's see the so so basically the, the detect the, the it can detect frequencies ranging from 10 megahertz to to up to uh, 120 megahertz and so on. And it's uh, it's essential for for good quality. So you really want the transducer to be uh, very broadband for for mesoscopy. Well, good answer. Um... I think you showed this, this was mentioned in the question, but uh, it, it's about longitudinal image. So can I image the same area repeatedly? Did I see marks on the skin where you were imaging? Yeah, so uh, yes. Uh, so so this is something that I, I, I didn't took care of explaining, And but yeah, you can image exactly the same area. You can image exactly the same microvascular structure. Uh, before and after therapy or before applying heat and after applying heat or whatever uh, what we do to do what we do to, to to visualize exactly the same skin area is use some markers so we draw some we, we make some marks in the skin some fiducial markers using ink and this allow us to um, so in the in, in the acquisition software uh, we, we have some presets that allow us to image exactly the same region and observe exactly the same microvascular structure uh, in one day one and then in day five or whatever. Of course, you have to take care, uh, take good care that the ink uh, doesn't 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 go away, right? Uh, so you have mm -hmm. to uh, you have to to yeah you have to manage the ink. Let's put it this way. <laughs> good use of a sharpie. Um... What I think is I'll ask one more question and then we'll round it up. We do have a few more outstanding, but we can address those separately. Um, and regarding psoriasis, uh, measurement by ARSOM, can you detect the permeability of vessels? Hmm. <laughs> so this is a, a nice clinical question, right? So the problem is we see hemolog we see the hemoglobin and um, we can't decide if it's inside the vessel or outside so if you have a hematoma or something like this you will see it as well um, mm. or if you have a lot of exorization you would see that as well but mm. we, we can't really decide on the image yeah okay cool so i'd say thank you again one that was like a really nice talk uh, thank you there christine for the additional support um yeah, As thank I've you mentioned, very much, Tim, and thank you, thank you to all the attendees. Thank you very much. Cheers, and we'll uh, we'll be in touch uh, with the recording in the next few days. And as mentioned, if you do want to see the device, do get in touch with uh, with me. And uh, thank you all for your time this afternoon.